what I'm reasonably good at is finding and creating win-wins and, and putting together what I call the, the problem puzzle or the partnership puzzle. I don't know. I need to coin one of these terms, but the problem <laughs> puzzle is like the whole deal. Like how does this all fit together and how does it work for the various parties that have a say? And what's helped me exponentially in my business is by having the right people around me. Welcome to Real Estate Deal Closers with Annette Tali, where we focus on the deals. Our guests are real estate closers who will share in detail the whole process from finding a deal to closing it, as well as strategies and tips to help you do the same. Here is your host, Annette Tali. Welcome to another episode of Real Estate Deal Closers. I am your host, Annette Tali, and my guest today is Phil Capron. Welcome, Phil. Hey, Annette. Happy to be with you. I'm very excited to have you because we are kind of connected through many mutual friends, but we just really got to know, know each other about a week ago. And so I'm excited to have you and to share with my audience your journey. So um, let me tell you a little bit about Phil before uh, he tells us his story and how he started on real estate. Uh, so Phil purchased his first property in 2010 while honorably serving in the United States Navy as a Naval Special Warfare Combat Craft Crewman. Uh, he realized in that first purchase that real estate was something he had passion for and committed to pursuing it further when his time in the service was over. By the way, thank you for your service. He took a real estate license course while still in the Navy. Upon separation from her service in 2012, immediately went to work selling his bodies from his old unit homes as they transferred to Virginia from other duty stations. That is very smart. <laughs> um, upon working while a real estate investor, Phil recognized the opportunity to capitalize on his new skill set and began flipping houses with one of his Navy teammates. Five years and 30 plus flips later, he was ready to create real wealth and dove headfirst into his first multifamily acquisition, a 13-unit property in Norfolk. Three years later and over 399 units later, he is a full-time multifamily acquisitions specialist. Phil prides himself of creating, creatively finding win-win situations for complex problems and credits his time to the military with his tenacious no-quit attitude and commitment to teamwork and delivering on his promises as a buyer. I love that. Um, so Phil, tell me, how did you get into real estate? Thank you for the wonderful introduction. I appreciate that. Probably a little too much, but uh, <laughs> yeah. So I like to jokingly say I got into real estate the same way everyone else does by being in the special ops in the Navy, being an ocean lifeguard, traveling around the country, playing drums for a punk rock band. I think that's that's how everyone does right <laughs> no okay <laughs> got it yeah so um what's so cool about real estate is it truly is accessible to everyone you don't have to go to harvard you don't have to become a doctor or a lawyer or a cpa you simply mm -hmm. learn about the asset class that you want to work within the market um, that you want to spend your time in and and you go right so that was kind of my evolution um, as you mentioned, I bought my first home in the Navy and had a bunch of my buddies move in. They paid my entire mortgage so with the rent. So I was house hacking before I knew what house hacking was. So that was kind of nice. And then it just, it seemed logical that when I got out, if I sold real estate, then, you know, that's, that's where the money is. But I quickly learned that it's not much more than a job and a pretty stressful one at that. So, um, Fortunately, I kind of figured it out through the progression of selling, flipping, and then eventually owning. You know, I think everyone wants to speed up that timeline, but, you know, everyone's going to get there on the time that makes sense for them. Um, you know, listening to programs like this, definitely helpful getting your knowledge base up, which will, you know, enable you to take action sooner, possibly, than if you just kind of fail forward into it like I did. Um, but, uh, but yeah, today, as you mentioned, I'm doing the multifamily thing full time, um, running a cap, uh, running a, a company called mission first capital. And what we do is we bring, 
opportunity of big, um, you know, commercial assets down to the non-accredited investor. Because what I what I noticed with uh, you know my military background and that being a lot of my peer group is we don't make a tremendous amount of money, paid fairly, you know, get an allowance for housing, some other benefits, but you know you're not getting rich just being in the military. So the first thing I noticed is there's this thing called the, the Veterans Administration or VA loan. And that enables um, people who are in the military or who have honorably served, uh, enables them to purchase a primary residence with zero money down. That's pretty great, you know, considering if you're going the conventional route, it could be up to 20%. The first home that I bought was a quarter million bucks. So that would have been, wow, math is hard, 50,000 down. For me, I didn't have 50,000, but you know, the VA gave me or guaranteed, I should say, a mortgage to be given to me for that amount as a, you know, a guy and a single guy in his 20s. So that was pretty great. Um, and, and as we kind of progressed through the years of people paying my rent, I said, wait a second, they're paying my rent, I'm living for free. And every time I get a, a letter in the mail from the bank, I owe less. Over time, this is going to be really, really, really cool. So over the past decade, I've made a little over 100000 in equity on that first property, which is amazing. Um, I'm in the process of doing a, a refinance right now in which I'll be able to free up that cash. And so that kind of motivated me to write a book that uh, I released, um, oh, well, time's flying. I guess it was, uh, it was November 11th of 2019. Uh, and it's called Your VA Loan and How It Can Make You a Millionaire because it's what it did for me. It put me on the path to owning a lot of real estate and owning a lot of real estate is how most people in this country become financially free and wealthy. So back to Mission First Capital. Um, the Your VA Loan and How It Can Make You a Millionaire was a book that I, I self-published to try to get up people, veterans and, and military members to understand how powerful it is just to buy that one first house but I don't believe that that's enough. So Mission First enables um, you know, military members and veterans to invest as little as $5,000 and own a piece of these big buildings that, you know, that we're both buying. So it's pretty cool. You'll be hearing more about that um, in 2021 here. And Amazing. that brings us to present day. Yeah, it's amazing because, you know, doing syndications myself and raising capital for large projects, some people don't have the 25,000 or the 50,000 minimums that are required to, to invest on these uh, deals. So being, you know, providing that alternative of investing 5,000 to start, that is amazing because they are still creating wealth. And uh, I, I love that. Awesome. Congratulations on that. Thank you. One more thing I like about the fund more than the syndication, more than the joint ventures, is, as you mentioned, a lot of people don't have 25 or 50K. That's one barrier. But the other barrier is the Securities and Exchange Commission has restrictions on who can invest. It's an attempt to protect people from losing money they can't afford to lose, which is good. I think mm -hmm. ultimately that's a good thing. Um, but it's also prohibiting smart people who just don't happen to make that much money from getting involved in my opinion, one of the best asset classes there is, which is, you know, multifamily real estate. So, you know, with the structure that we have set up, the fund structure, we're able to accept people who aren't millionaires and who don't make 200,000 a year. So we're opening the floodgates to anyone, anyone that wants this asset class. I mean, you don't even have to be in the military. It's just, that's who that's, you know what I mean? That's the, the core of it for me is trying to bring it down to those folks. But Hey, if, uh, you know, you're a truck driver or a nurse, you know, come on, like, if you, if you like what we, uh, what we're doing over there, um, you know, we'd love to love to speak with you. But an, another thing is in a syndication, if you fire 50,000 into one syndication and that thing goes south, that's it. With our fund, we're buying many, 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 many buildings. So we're hedged across, uh, you know, a lot of different assets in several different markets. So I think that also is a good thing. Amazing. The deal. All right. So let's get to the deal. What deal do you want to talk about today? The deal. Okay. 
So I know that I know that uh, your viewers and listeners, they're smart people. They're in real estate, they're investing in real estate. So we don't have to take it down to the super basic. But what I wanted to talk about is a joint venture I did, which was my first, I guess you call it major deal. It was 108 units um, in Norfolk, Virginia, and it was listed for 5.5 million. Yeah. Wow. So it was this a uh, class A, B, or C property? C and a value add C. A value so add C. What, what had happened was um, these properties were built in the 1970s and 80s by a gentleman, and then he passed away, and they were being managed out of state by the kids who were, you know, grown, you know, 40s, 50s at this point. Um, and they just didn't really have the appetite for it. So they let it go for a few years, made some money, refinanced, took some money out and just, it slowly was starting to decay. So they said, mm -hmm. Hey, we better, we better get rid of this before, you know, too we, late. We, yeah, exactly. Um, so, so that's why I said it was more of a value add. There was some areas in which we could go in and improve both management and construction. Awesome. So how, how did you come across this deal? How did you find it? This is going to shock you because every other podcast says that you can't get a deal on LoopNet. Well, <laughs> got a yeah. deal on LoopNet. So listed for 5.5 million. Um, at this point, I own 15 units. The 13 unit building you mentioned, that was my first deal. And then a couple of single families I'd picked up. Um, well, that, is a, that is an amazing jump from 15 yeah. units to how many were there? 108. 108, that's big. That's so that's what I want to share with your folks here my, I guess, system that I created uh, in the process of this deal to make that happen. Mm -hmm. So I get on the phone with the broker and we're, we're talking about it and, um, you know, booked a tour, went to look at it and said, hey, you know, there's a fair amount of construction that's going to be required here. We're down to do it, but what's the right price? And so we were haggling back and forth. I'll spare you all the, the, the blow by blow. But we ended up um, purchasing that property for 3.95 million. Wow, that's amazing! How long was this property on the market? Mm, close to a year, and it had two contracts fall through, which is why we were able to sneak in and get it for such a great basis. I love that. I love properties that sit on the market yeah. for a long time, and especially when they have, you know, uh, uh, contracts fall through, because you know that by the time that you get in, they are ready. They don't want to go through this anymore. They just want, and they are ready. You know, the first time that the contract fell through, they're like, oh, no, 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 we want the money and we're not going to change anything. The second one, they are ready to give a couple of concessions. The third time they are like, let's just do they're it. Done. Let's get it done. And that's exactly. So I tell you what, I'll thank my lucky stars because the, the time that I showed up to that one was the absolute perfect time. Um, so the way that I, so in your, in my bio, you said something about, you know, creating win-wins. It's very mm -hmm. important to me. Everyone has to win. It, it can't be a zero sum where I take everything that you have. And then I get a little bit more and you're left with nothing. Mm -hmm. It's bad karma. And you know, just, it doesn't, doesn't really work. Doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Right. So the first person or the first group I had to make a win for was this broker who had been getting beat up for a year mm -hmm. um, with this complicated portfolio of properties. And, um, uh, so I said, Hey, look, you know, I know that we're not going to be best on price here. I know there's probably some other people that might want to pay a little bit more, but we're professional house flippers. My partner and I, we run a house flipping company. Here's an example of our, you know, kind of portfolio of work, what we've done. We've done really extensive things. So what I'm seeing in there, like, it doesn't scare me away, but I know that costs money, which is why I need it for the price that I'm talking about here and not the price you have it listed for. And so I got them to buy in. They didn't want a third contract to go through and potentially lose the listing. So then they took my case and presented it to the seller who, like you said, was just sort of like, all right, we got to get this done. We'll still make some money. Let's make it happen. So we did. And the important term in my, in my contract was we will not retrade you, AKA ask for a price discount or anything other concessions after, you know, due diligence if for something comes up that one of the buildings is falling into the sea or something like we're just gonna say hey we're sorry we screwed up we're out um we're not gonna ask you for more money 
and they really like that. So I got the contract, but here was the, here was the, the tough thing. You know, I, my net worth at that point was not terribly impressive. Um, you know, didn't have a great verifiable income because as a real estate agent and as, and as a flipper, it just fluctuates so wildly. Banks tend to not like mm-hmm. that, yeah. you know, um, if you do it properly through, um, you know, S-Corps and, you know, everything, you pay yourself as an employee, there's, there's workarounds, but I didn't understand those at that point. I was just like, hey, I'm making money to school. Um, so basically, as far as the bank was concerned, I was worthless. Um, yeah. But I did secure a contract for a really, really, really good deal. Mm-hmm. So the first thing I did is get my partner from my flipping company on board, who is a great businessman, uh, impressive net worth, impressive income. The bank loved him. So that was cool. But now we need to figure out how we're doing the construction on 108 units. So um, it, it was beyond. Let's, let's pause on this for a second. Yeah, let's sorry. On this for a second. Okay. Because I think, you know, I, I want you to explain, you know, how that affected because, you know, you know, if you find this great deal, you can get other people to be your partners and use their net worth to get a loan. Like if you don't have the net worth like you didn't have, there is other options that they can explore. So so what did the bank look at and why why did they like your uh, friend so much? Well, because, uh, you know, his net worth is very high. Um, generally, the bank is going to want a net worth for the partnership at least as high as the purchase price or the loan amount. Loan amount would be the bare minimum, but a purchase price is, is a good metric. So you, you overshoot it for, by a little bit. So my partner in, in one fell swoop accomplished that. Absolutely. Uh-huh. And also they, they knew they knew that this property was worth a lot more than what you were getting it for. They had the listing for 5.5 and you were getting it for 3.95. So right. they knew that they, there was equity there to, to be made. All right. Awesome. I'm sorry. Keep, keep going. Yeah. Well, so that's funny that you say that. They didn't know it yet. I told them they didn't believe me. Mm-hmm. But in another important thing in, in crafting a good deal, especially as it relates to a bank, is making sure your appraiser has everything they need to give you the appraisal that you want. So when we eventually did get it appraised for the bank, you know, I met them out there, I gave them all the rental comps, all the market comps, all the construction plans, everything we we're gonna do, just, just waited on them hand and foot. And our, yeah, our appraisal came in saying that we were buying it with $1.6 million worth of equity as is. Absolutely. And I love that. This is like an expert tip, people. I do this even with my small multifamilies. I print out all the comparables. I even print out comparables, the condition, like the pictures inside these comparables so that they can see that my building is better or is the same. Obviously, I don't want to show one that is not. <laughs> but, you know, if they are comparables, they are going to be pretty similar. So I make sure that I, you know, show rents, what are they renting for as well, so that they have this information. You know, some of them don't want to take it. Some of them will take it. So you just, you know, you want you want to be prepared. Yep. Yep. So the bank was very happy when the appraisal came back and we had such a strong sponsorship team and then, you know, an asset with so much built in value. And they said that by the time we were done with it, there should be about two and a half million dollars worth of equity in there. What, what were the terms of the loan that they offer you? And once they got the appraisal, did they, did they improve it or it, it stayed the same? Oh, I wish, I wish. Um, we were fortunate to get a 75% loan, which, you know, it's it's not mega high leverage, but it's it's reasonable leverage, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, we actually got a couple bucks in there included in that 75% for renovation. Okay. So that was cool. So, so truly it was, it was levered a little higher than that. Um, I don't have the exact figures in front of me, but, but the, the global leverage is around 75. Okay, cool. And, um, but you still had about a million dollar in, in money that you had to come up with. So how did you fund this down payment? We had to come up with one point math is hard. 1.1, I think was, was what we ended up having to come up with. So here's another another pro tip for you. 
Um, if you're really confident about your deal, debt is way better than equity. What I mean by that is in a syndication, you know, the investors are getting the lion's share of the equity, the lion's share of the, uh, the ownership in the property for their cash, right? 70, 30, 80, 20, whatever the split may be. What we did as a partnership is each one of us put up 150,000. So that was 600K. And then we borrowed half a million at a high rate. I think it was like 10% or something like that with two years to pay it back, three years to pay it back. And I don't remember the exact terms from uh, a friend of one of the partners that just was looking to, to place some money and have a decent return. So what that did is, uh, you know, it, it, it made our debt obligations higher um, once we got in there. But once we were able to pay that person back, we didn't sacrifice any equity outside the partnership, which is cool. All right. So you had four partners? Mm -hmm. Three and partners. The, to, yeah, four of us total. All right. So you guys came up with 600,000. You still needed about six or 700,000. And uh, then that money, you did it like a hard money or a private lender? Yeah, just a private loan. Yep. Private loan. Okay. So you were basically leveraging uh, this puppy at 95%, really. Like you right. had almost no money in the deal. <laughs> I mean, 600,000 is yeah, pretty big, it, but, yeah. but, but that, but you know, relatively for a, speaking, relatively speaking, it was not much. Yeah, it was not yeah. much, which is awesome. That's what, you know, when people, when you hear other people money, you know, this is what it is. He had uh, an amazing bank, bank loan for 75%. And then he went and got half a million with a private lender or a hard money lender. And it was for two years with a high interest, but you knew that this property was, you know, it will have like 2 million in equity, like you mentioned, when you were done. So you could, you know, refinance that right away. If you could, I don't know if your loan allowed you to refinance. That's another thing. We're getting into so many just great, like pro tips here is, yeah, you have to watch what your, your terms are with your loan. And so that was something we fought really hard for on the front end with our senior debt is that we wanted a super flexible prepay. Um, okay. Cause it was with a community bank. It's not like a government agency or life insurance or anything like that. Um, so, you know, we negotiated that after one year, it was an open, basically we could prepay with no penalty. And that's exactly what we did. Mm -hmm. you know, we went in there, we, we uh, did our construction, we raised the rents to market and you know, we uh, cashed out with a new valuation of 8 million, paid back our guy, his, you know, half a million and paid back our money. And well, not all of it, but most of it. And now the, the thing will uh, produce about a quarter million a year in cash flow with almost no money into it for Amazing. partners to split. So it's kind of Amazing. fun. Amazing. That, so basically now, I don't know how much you paid back yourselves, but let's say you paid back yourself 50. You only had 400,000, a hundred, you know, hundred each. Yeah. hundred each. And, uh, you know, you are making 250,000 a year in cash flow. Yeah. Incredible. Yeah, so just, yeah. Just say that it's 50, 50 per partner. I mean, yeah, it's 50% a year. That's mm -hmm. strong. Amazing. They're so <laughs> how, you know, tell me a little bit about the construction. Um, so, uh, in, and even the inspection, were there any surprises once you inspected? Not really. Um, yeah, nothing too noteworthy. Um, it's important when you're inspecting in particularly older buildings to really dig into the, the major systems. So things to watch out for would be like, you know, um, bad electrical panels. I mean, knob and tube wiring, you know, depending on how old, um, your asbestos, your lead, um, you know, uh, plumbing, is it, is it poly? Is it, um, you know, cast, uh, iron. cast iron waistlines that don't have enough slope, they're going to eventually rot out, mm -hmm. you know, and that, that's sort of stuff that you learn along the way. So if you're newer, having a great builder, building inspector and contractor, you must have that. I still do it with every building, you know, and I feel like I know enough to be dangerous. Um, but yeah, not, nothing, nothing uh, was revealed that was, was tragic. I'll say that. Right. Yeah. I think um, a, a pro tip would be to partner with somebody that is in the building um, 
construction business, you know, like a contractor, a GC that they can, you know, when they look at the property, they can give you a reasonable budget. And then with a good ins in inspector, that's going to find the stuff that is kind of hidden. And then they, you can budget for that. Awesome. Okay. So you didn't find any crazy surprises. Your price was good. And then you went and, and closed. So now tell me a little bit about the construction. How long did it take to renovate the units? And how was the transition? Did you uh, do it all at once or did you do it as people were going? Did you have a lot of vacancy where you could start the renovations without getting, you know, decreasing the, the income? Gotcha. So you gave me a perfect segue into my third partner, which is my construction guy. Oh, perfect. <laughs> oh, I brought him on as an inspector. Uh, we'd worked together in the past. And I said, hey, buddy, how about we do this one together? And he said, Phil, I love you. You're great, but I don't think you know what you're doing here. Like, I think the deal's probably good, but I don't want to get in there and do all this work. And then it'd be ruined because, um, you know, it's not managed properly. So enter the fourth partner who... Um, was a commercial broker for 30 years and had done this stuff his entire life. So I said, hey, can you come with me and show this guy around and talk to him about the construction aspects? I said, hey, I would like your experience. I'd like you to be a partner on this. And he said, the only way I would be a partner on this is if the construction guy was a partner on this. And I said, well, I offered the construction guy a partner on this as he's sitting right there. And he told me no. And the <laughs> construction guy said, well, the only way I'd be partner on this is if he's partner on this. I said, well, looks Let's like we have it. a four-way partnership then. And we shook hands and that was that. That's so, awesome. Yeah, it was kind of kind of fun how that that whole thing unfolded. And it gets back to sort of my central premise here is you have to figure out win-wins. So in order to have the bank win, I needed my flipping partner who is very impressive financially. In order to make the deal work, I needed my construction partner. But in order to get him, I needed the broker with, you know, the, uh, you know, his years and decades of expertise. And in order to get the broker, I needed the, so anyway, it all meshed together like perfect. And uh, so away, away we went. The construction was a long- Let me ask you, let me ask you something quickly before we go. So this partnership was before you sent the LOI or- when you were already under contract and you really had to come up with the money. So tell me about that. Yeah. Yeah. As you see, my background is skydiving. It's like jumping and building your parachute on the way down. So what I believe and what we'll get to when we, uh, when we get to the, the three tips is, you, you know, if you don't have a deal, you have nothing. Right. So I knew I had a deal because I knew my market mm -hmm. and I didn't really care who was coming along with me, which was naive um, at the time because who you partner with really does matter. Mm -hmm. uh, but I knew that some way or another, we were going to be able to make this work. Mm -hmm. So um, to your point, I didn't, I didn't have anything. You just knew, you just knew it was such a good deal that it, you were, were going to be able to figure it out on the, on the way. I mean, yeah. I mean, we were in for 36,000 a door and markets like 55 to 60 a door for similar product and a similar NOI at like a eight cap. Mm -hmm. So like, yeah, I mean, we had a, we had a lot of room to, to make it work. And, um, you know, I didn't know that much back then, but I knew that I, I knew that I had a deal and I was okay. determined to make it work. All right. So what about these relationships with the broker and with the construction person? How did you form these relationships because this is important. Like, you know, nobody's going to partner with you if they just met you. Hey, my name is Annette. Do you want to partner with me and put like 150,000? And your risk, because it, it was probably, um, they had to put their information for the loan as well, right? It was a recourse loan. So it was not only the money, but their credit, their, you know, their, their net worth at risk. Correct. So your reputation matters, um, you know, Everyone that was my partner, I either knew directly or it was a very, very good referral. So the broker was the, the one that I knew the least. And he came as a referral from my wonderful CPA. And 
um, you know, so when he said, you know, this is good, go for it, then, um, you know, he, he was comfortable to come onto the team. Okay, cool. All right. So I guess we only have the, the question, what was the exit strategy for this property? So we've refinanced, we got most of our money back and now we're just letting it make money. Um, you know, we got a great loan. We got 3.27%, um, you know, 10 year term. So did you refinance with the same bank or did you go somewhere else? A different else? one, a different, actually another community bank, but we have so much equity in the property that, you know, we weren't really, the, the recourse doesn't bother us. Uh, we want the flexibility of a, a very low prepay, the ability to maybe go back and refinance with them and recapture some additional equity um, or the ability to, um, to split up the portfolio and maybe sell off some buildings, not others. So we just, Flexibility and cash flow were kind of our priorities with uh, awesome. And I mean, I know that you know you're holding it right now, but is it the goal to sell it eventually or if or, or is it the plan to keep it long term if possible? So here's the thing. Um, those who invest with us passively, they want us to sell. Mm -hmm. I don't ever want to sell, which is why I do like joint ventures is you know, I can keep it for the next 25 years, 30 years and it'll be totally cool. Is it optimal from a tax perspective? Maybe not, um, but you know, it just- Creates more wealth. Yeah, creates more wealth. And it's exhausting to, to sell in the 1031 and to find the next deal and to go and to run the whole race again when we're really happy with the assets that we have, we've built them the last, we've con you know, done the construction the right way. So, I mean, I, I believe we'll probably own them for the next 20 years at least. Awesome. I love it. So what type of renovations you had to do per unit? Let's, let's talk about the construction and the renovation. Oh, uh, it just, it, it kind of, it, it, uh, sort of ran the whole spectrum from paint and flooring to, you know, um, there's one building that we replumbed. It was the old, uh, polybutylene pipe. So we replumbed the whole building. We did the roofs, the windows, the siding, we did stack stone accents. We rebuilt the stairwells. We did floors, walls, new soft closed cabinets, stainless steel appliances, ran circuits for microwaves and dishwashers, added ceiling fans. Like it, so it, it, de it depended on exactly what it, which, which uh, part of the portfolio it was. Um, mm -hmm. So it's, it's nice to kind of have that experience. So you took this maybe in, in, in some properties <laughs> from a C to a B. For sure, actually, probably to yeah, yeah, to B plus, because okay. of the location and the and the fixtures. I mean, an old building's an old building, but when it's been completely rebuilt, doesn't really matter that it's eighties vintage. It's it's beautiful, right? And did you have a lot of vacancies, or did you have to get rid of some tenants to start these renovations? So a lot of them, we just raised the rent to close to market, and they stayed. If they didn't, we turned the units. And then the two buildings that we took from like a solid C to like a B, B plus, we actually emptied the buildings. You know, mm -hmm. we either did a, a cash for keys or just sort of waited till most of the leases were up and then started construction. The, last, the rest filtered out as they filtered out. And those couple of buildings have been just the most unbelievable transformations. Amazing feel. They're really fun. I, I just love that part when you turn the building around and you start getting tenants that care you know, and, and, and appreciate it. And then they look at the property and they're like, I love it. I want to move in. Like what yeah. do I need to do? You know? Yeah. Those ones, they're like HGTV. I'm truly <laughs> proud of what we've accomplished on, on the couple that we really, really repositioned. And even the ones that are still like, you know, C or B minus now, instead of just being workforce housing, they're like very, like people are happy to be there. They're excited to move in. And that's what we like. Um, you know, Productivity hack. All right. Okay. So now I want to ask you, what is the productivity hack? What have you yeah. done in your business that has helped you exponentially and, and grow in your business? So I'm not very good at much. Um, what I'm reasonably good at is finding and creating win-wins and, and putting together what I call the 
the problem puzzle or the partnership puzzle. I don't know. I need to coin one of these terms. But the problem <laughs> puzzle is like the whole deal. Like how does this all fit together and how does it work for the various parties that have a say? And what's helped me exponentially in my business is by having the right people around me. So my construction partner, invaluable. He knows who he is. I wouldn't be able to do anything, you know, without him. Um, you know, I was okay at flipping houses, but managing the crews was never my strong suit. So if they went off the rails, the project went off the rails. He, he takes care of all that for me. Um, same thing with my management team. So I've got a couple different property managers that I work with across my portfolio. And boy, if I, I was left to do all that on myself, I would be, I would be totally screwed, you know? Um, then working with my brokers that bring me deals off market, working with my <laughs> passive investors that, you know, send me a lot of equity without even really knowing much, you know, my, my one buddy, uh, Florida guy, I mean, sent me you know half a million dollars this year with, I mean, he, he, he didn't even need to know the details. And that's the great thing about building those relationships and, and having a little bit of building a little track record of success is all these things, they just start to like magnet more into your, your, your sphere there. So. All right. So it's a little bit of a, about delegation to the, the right people. That will be your productivity hack. Expert tips. Awesome. Now is the part of the show when you are going to give me three expert tips. And Phil wanted to give me three expert tips on how to get into your first deal and make it successful. So this is just going to be a cliff notes of basically the full episode so far. Um, you know, a lot of people wonder what is the most important thing to get into your first or next deal. And I say it's valuation. If you don't know what you're looking at, it doesn't matter how many deals you're analyzing. If you're just using some stupid rule of thumb, like, oh, the deal doesn't work. Like you need to understand your market, like the back of your hand, you need to understand the forces at play, why people are moving, why people are selecting one side of the tracks over the other, the path of progress. Once you understand that, when a deal comes up, it will, it'll be like neon, like this one was for me and you'll find a way to make it work. So that's number one. Number two is what I'm calling the, the partnership puzzle is you know, you shouldn't be a jack of all trades. You should, or a Jill of all trades for that matter. Um, you should figure out what you're great at and you should surround yourself by the best in class of the other areas that are going to be required to make a particular project work. Then once you've come to the finish line, people don't like to talk about this much. They like to talk about getting deals, not about running deals. Once you're running the deal, you have to understand how to make your property somebody's first best option in the marketplace. Where you lay your head at night, it's kind of like your significant other. You go for like the one you want the most. <laughs> and, and like, you know, if for some reason it's outside your price range or something, then you're like, oh, okay, I got to go for this one. <laughs> And, and I believe that housing is the exact same way. People are always going to do the absolute best that they can with their housing choice. And then once they're in there, kind of like a relationship, you have to treat them well. You have to make them want to stay. You can't just, ah, we, we gotcha. No, nah, it doesn't, it doesn't work like that. Like you have to make your residents' lives better. You, you know, you have to make them actively want to do that lease renewal. So that to me is how you win in this business. Amazing. I love, I love what, what you said. Uh, knowing your area is so important because, you know, you're going to have deals coming your way. And if you cannot quickly on your feet say, okay, I like, I like the area, then you're going to be wasting a lot of times. So if you, if you know your area and something comes up, you are going to know right away, okay, this is in a good place. I'm going to look into it more right away because it's going to fly. Um, I had one property that came on the market. I saw it and I was in the area. So I drove by it and I, I knew it was good. So while I was going to see it, I called my real estate, my uh, realtor and said, I want to send an offer today for this property. And so we had an offer that same afternoon. 
because I knew that the property was amazing. They ended up canceling the contract because the partners couldn't decide one wanted to sell and the other one didn't. But hmm. I knew that the property was a good deal right away. Fortune favors the bold. Yep. One of the one of the one of my favorite lines in when I was selling real estate is if you sleep on it, you might not sleep in it. <laughs> same thing, same thing with investment. Like if it's good, take it. Like yeah. go. Um, a mentor of mine, you know, told me he was in his 60s that he's lost so much money on the buildings that he didn't buy in his 20s, 30s, and even 40s before he really figured it out. And like I'm 36, so hopefully I'm figuring it out. I don't, I don't know. We'll see. Um, time will tell. But he was talking about how in his 20s, he was looking at, you know, the little duplex that was priced at 100000 and he tried to get it for ninety or 92, and then he got outbid at 95 or 97, and don't, you know, on to the next one. Then when he started doing bigger stuff, it was like, you know, in his 30s, they wanted a million, but he was trying to be at 925, and the guy won it for nine, 945. Don't, you know, he went and looked back, I guess, just because he's kind of a masochist about all the money he'd lost. The $100,000 property in the 80s or whatever it was is now worth, you know, 350,000, a million went to 4 million. And, and he lost, you know, he lost them over a couple percentage points. Yes. So his that advice is, is buy the building. Yeah, the that is such a... So that that is such a good tip because you know i tell you my mentor we were buying our first building and we offer it was a similar situation my husband saw it uh, you know at, it came to the market or to the mls because we were working with a realtor on the first one and like 7 p.m and he said i'm gonna drive by it because i like the area so he went and drove by it and he came in the dark and he came back and said like i really like it so we called our realtor that night we had a contract next day we sent it and they said we're waiting until monday for offers uh, and we knew it was under market you know it was worth a hundred and they listed it for 80 so they were looking for a lot of uh, offers right so by monday they had 15 offers and Jeez. they called us three people to do the, the best and final. And so I was talking to my mentor, like, what do I do? What do I do? And he said, you got to think of, like an investor. Like now is the time to think like an investor. An investor will put 10,000 more because they know it's worth it. An investor is going to, you know, they are not going to do like a hundred dollars more. They are not going to do a thousand more. They are going to go for the price that it's worth. So we ended up offering 20,000 more. And just a little bit because we knew it was worth a hundred. So we offer a hundred thousand and $117, some odd number because um, we knew that the property was worth more. Did you get it? Yes, I did. Wow. We got it. Okay. We got it. I was kidding. <laughs> yes. I said, okay, I hope you got it. <laughs> so that's, we that's, did. So, that's so funny. And he, even like my 13 unit, I look back on and there's been so many growing pains associated with my first deal. But I look back and it's like, you know, I owe, I don't know, 780 on the thing. And I've got brokers that are like, can we list this for 1.1 million? And this is like three years ago. I'm like, that would be pretty cool, actually. <laughs> like, can, if you can get me that, like, I absolutely will sell it. And, and uh, especially with what's going on in the macro economy and how much money we're adding to our, our federal balance sheet. Um, you know, inflation's coming, folks. You want to be in hard assets and you want to be in stuff that's going to last the long term. And I think what we are doing is just that. Awesome. Thank you so much for being here. And uh, so can you tell people, where can they find you online? Oh, geez. I'm never ready for this. I'm never ready for this question. Um, if you look for on Facebook, my fund, uh, Mission First Capital, Mission First Capital on Facebook. And the website, I believe, is going live very soon. So missionfirstcapital.co. Awesome. So Facebook and the website that is coming up really soon. Thank you so much for being he here. And thank you for adding so much value to my audience. And I am super excited to, to talk to you today. Thank you so much, Annette. This is awesome. 
This was Real Estate Deal Closers with Annette Tali, brought to you by Tali Investments. We hope that you enjoyed this episode. Our goal is to provide amazing value on your real estate journey. Connect online at www.taleeinvestments.com where you can find this episode and more. Did you like this episode? Subscribe, like, and share.